is which is what agroecology is all about so we do that online and in the field um, we've got lots of YouTube videos out there so do check out our YouTube channel um, and if you're interested you can sign up to our e-newsletter uh, letter uh, which is around here um, so the next topic we've got half an hour now um, on something that I'm very passionate about so I'm really excited to have all these people here to um, chat with us about it um, with reducing uh, effectiveness and what's available in terms of herbicides um, and also an interest to be looking at more more sustainable ecologically focused systems um, there's a real interest in non-chemical weed control options um, so we're, we're going to have a bit of a chat here i'm going to ask a few questions to to these guys and then we'll open it up to you guys to have have your questions too um, my name is Katie Bliss from Agricology, um, and I will invite you guys to tell us who you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's had a nice lunch. Um, I'm Lynn Tatnell. I'm a weed scientist at ADAS. I'm at Boxworth in Cambridgeshire, but um, I work on a wide range of weed control issues, chemical, non-chemical, so I'm always happy to talk about weeds and looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. Uh, hello, I'm James Alexander, a uh, contractor farmer from the Cotswolds. We farm organically and conventionally, um, so we get a bit of an insight from weed control from both sides, really. I think that's why I've been asked here today. Hi, I'm Nicola Cannon. I'm a lecturer in agronomy at the Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester and run uh, various trials out on the uni farms, both on organic and non-organic land. Um, about cultivation, mechanical weeding and various aspects like that. Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Alford, I'm Arable and Soils Advisor at the Soil Association. Um, I'm a retired farmer, which is quite unusual, farmed organically and conventionally down in Devon um, and I now have this role with the Soil Association. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so my first question um, to all of you actually is what what new weed problems are we seeing in no in reduced and no till systems are there new weeds that are emerging um, and how can we see control them I don't know you're probably the experts out here on the new weeds coming through in, in your own farms I mean I deal a lot with conventional farmers with black grass problems and obviously no till can have its own issues with black grass and black grass management so in that sense you've got to think about your own seed bank and where the weeds are and where the seeds are in that seed bank so if you're coming away from a plough system um, on a rotational basis you've really really got to think about where the weeds are in the seed bank so um, I mean black grass is something that probably dominates maybe that's a discussion we can have in a minute um, but again some of your perennial weeds might be starting to come through if you're not doing a deeper cultivation system so I think perhaps as we have our discussion going through, this will be something that we can talk about if people have got specific issues. Um, we're seeing quite a lot more of the umbelifery, so the carrot family weeds coming into um, the um, lower intensity cultivated land, um, which although perhaps not as competitive as black grass and not such a challenge it is interesting that it's broadleaf and um and grass weeds in that situation as well um i'm going to throw it out there now um we've actually got rid of most black grass and weeds on the no-till farm um so that's 12 years no-till conventional um normally only use one herbicide in the in the in the year on a crop um, but on the organic farm, we're now finding black grass is becoming a problem. Um, that's 10 years and organic, um, so ploughing doesn't kill black grass. It just fills the soil up with seeds, like you said, in the soil bank, and um, we just keep moving them around. Um, so we're trying to actually reduce cultivations on the organic farm now to move. I don't think we can move to no-till, but we can probably move to very, very much reduced tillage. And I think... The most phone calls we get in our office and the producer support team from the, the Soil Association is still about the old favourites. It's thistles, it's docks, it's charlock, and it's grass weeds at the bottom because we're not getting competitive enough crops. And uh, what, so if we're looking at non chemical control, kind of broadly, what, uh, maybe this is to you, Lynn, what, um, what alternatives are out there kind of on the horizon for for non-chemical weed control kind of things you're working with okay so we'd like to think 
that people are starting to move towards um, a kind of IPM system, an IWM specifically for weeds. So there's all sorts of different options. Cultural control would be a great one um, for conventional farming, but using lots of things like changing your varieties, changing, looking at your drilling dates, thinking about again where those weeds are in the seed bank. Can you trick the weeds to stop them germinating when your crop's germinating? Um, but there's lots of new technologies and ideas as well, so not just your mechanical control, but I mean we're working in a, a non-arable situation at the moment, but Jerry and I are both on a field lab with an electrical weed control system, and we can talk about that in a bit more detail if people are really interested, but again that's fantastic on a lot of your perennial weeds like creeping thistle, docks, um, so this kind of technology hopefully we'll see coming through into um, wider arable conventional systems and organic systems. And, and on the electric weeding one, I've seen examples in Germany where they've actually got it on with hoods and they use it between soybean plants, so they run up between the rows, so you're just killing the weeds between the row and protecting the plant. Um, the other thing we're looking at organically is looking at the understory, so trying to grow crops below the, the halfted crop. Um, we're setting up at the moment an invited farmers field trial on no-till organic. So having a permanent understory of white clovers, subterranean clovers, and the guy who's farm is coming in, he's a conventional farmer, but he's very far forward thinking. He's thinking about robots, but even mounting, his latest idea was a series of lawn mowers mounted on a boom to run up between the rows. He'll drill on wide drill widths, small, and just to cut the clover constantly. By doing so, we'll free up some of the nitrogen for the plant and also keep the weeds down. So it's sort of really, really going out into really weird directions. We did um, some under sowing work um, a few years back and found that white clover was quite good at um, suppressing some of the weeds. Definitely was better than no under sun. Um, we also did black medic in there, but found that the white clover just got away a bit more vigorously as a bigger plant. Um, but as we all know, like this year where there's, well, especially over our side of the country, there's been plenty of moisture, um, sometimes that can become a competitive issue. But I definitely think with some control in there. Um, I've been involved with a European um, non-chemical weed control group and um, we've been talking about uh, different technologies being used across Europe including kind of punch downs and potential detection systems so that differentiating so you can differentiate broadleaf weeds and and cereals quite easily and easily uh, you know, obviously it's hard to differentiate charlock and oilseed rape, but those systems and using it more off light reflectance systems and we're working with the University of Bath on different spectrums to try and make that work and hopefully once you've got that equipment running you can get little robots out there and, and use the solutions quite quickly. Um, so what we're actually doing on the farm, conventionally um, we're direct drilling, we're uh, wherever we've got time, probably 10 weeks plus, we're putting a cover crop in between crops. Um, hopefully we're going to be joining Jerry's Field Lab with some understory white clover, both organically and conventionally. Um, it's something I've tried to do, but I haven't got the white clover to establish yet. On the organic farm, what we do, our main weed control probably is our either two-year clover lays or one-year vetch and rye crops. Um, they're our fertility building lays, but they're also cl our cleaning up crops. Um, so they get topped, well, the clover probably gets topped this year. It's probably going to get topped ten, to ty ten times this year, because um, we've already done it five times. Um, and then the vetch and rye grows once, top it, um, and that gives us a clean entry for winter wheat. Um, and then we've got a bit, and we've got a mechanical machine as well on the organic farm for taking docks and thistles out. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. Right. What what machine is it for taking the time cut? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Is was that one of the one you tried at the uh, itch trials at RAU? Can you tell us a bit about yeah, that? Yeah. So the comb cut is generally not a standalone machine. So it's used in combination with another mechanical weed control, but it works on the height differential between the crop and the weed. So um, it's literally kind of running with a series of blades above the crop and cutting everything out. It's not removing it, although I imagine that you could quite easily make a remove system for it. It's throwing it back into the, into the canopy. Therefore, if you had set seeds, such as if you went through black grass that was higher than wheat at the moment, if the seeds were set, that it's not really going to help in that much in seed return. But 
it can make a big visual difference and we um, looked at weed seed banks afterwards and um, we reckon it had some impact on um, seed returns back into the system but it, we used it in combination with the Opico um, Haricome um, weeder um, which is a broad spectrum weeder rather than interro. Um, what other mechanical weed options did you try in those trials? Yeah, so um, we had unweeded, which and it was a it was a second wheat in an organic situation, which is is quite a challenging scenario. Um, so we had the opico, um, and then we had the comb cut, which and the combination of those. We had a rotor net, um, which worked on kind of spinning. Um, kind of tines um, and that was quite difficult it bounced quite a lot we had a lot of trouble setting that up and that was probably the least effective um, and we also had the um, robo crop which is the Garford machine um, the thing about these systems is when you go into them you kind of need to know what we control you're planning later on because if you want to go for a into row hoe you've got to make sure you've got wide enough row spacing to go off and one of our approaches to weed control on our farm is to go for 15 centimeter or 17 centimeter rows um, so that they meet between them so you're looking for a competitive advantage from the wheat and that makes the guidance for a into row hoe, a camera system on an into row hoe very challenging because it's kind of blurring the rows quite a lot so i'd say if you want to go into a camera guidance system you either need to be working on things like maize or row crops more or setting up your system initially that you're aware that you're going to use an inter row hoe what's the minimum width for an inter row hoe then well, it depends how late you want to use it in the system. So if you're going early, you've got a smaller canopy. Um, and actually, I think there's some quite interesting work to be done there, looking at frosts and working off frosts a bit more and getting in earlier. Um, and in the particular season we ran it, it was, it was um, wet, 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 and then dry, as we quite often have. Whereas if we'd gone in on a frost, we could have perhaps taken out some of those earlier established weeds more effectively and the rows would have worked. I would probably say 25 centimetres. It's quite, it's quite wide to get the systems going. Right. Any other questions out there? No. Um, have you ever used a, is it a chat table? Have you heard of those with it? Yeah. I think potential of those are brilliant. Um, not the big, very, very expensive Australian first off Harrington machine, which is ending from $20,000. Um, either to collect all the chaff and chop it up, grind it up into small, or just drop it behind the tram lines if you're on a CTF. And CTF can work in organic just as well as it can in conventional. So that's where you drop the seeds from the chaff behind on the tram line, effectively. So you're constantly driving it. So I think if we can stop spreading seeds back out with the combine, the combine is one of the best seeders there is in the country because it spreads all small seeds everywhere. But if we can concentrate in small areas, so I think the potential for those sort of products is, is is massive, particularly just to take the seeds out. Yeah. Um, and Lynn, we've talked, oh, are we going to come back on that? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, just to comment on that, obviously um, they use them in Australia really well for ryegrass, but it's, it's um, still the seed is not shedding when the crop is, whereas obviously our blackgrass here tends to shed um, a lot earlier. And so unfortunately a lot of the seed is already in on, on the soil surface. So it has a potential definitely, but um, unfortunately the timing of blackgrass and of our harvest means that most of the seed is already on the um, ground. So unfortunately we want to try and get rid of the black grass before we get to that stage if we if we possibly can. But but yeah, I think they've got huge potential for other grass weeds and other species. Is that even, is, is even the case with winter barley, say? With yeah, I mean winter barley is a bit better because you're obviously harvesting that bit earlier so you may still have green um, heads then or seed that have not fully shed. So it's much better for winter barley than, cere than uh, wheat. Um, is anyone out there in a no-till system seeing any particular weed problems emerging? Um, anyone? We've got rats, rats tail fescue. Yeah, yeah again, in, in certainly increasing. We're having a lot more discussion about that um, and a lot more interest. We're getting samples sent in for ID. Um, so it's one to watch. We don't think we've got any herbicide resistance issues with that, but it's certainly tolerant of a lot of the herbicides we're applying. And it's coping with a lot of the. 
Just exactly. So you've got to be very careful. And again, all I'd say with that at the moment is monitor where you've got it. Whereabouts are you in the country? Okay. Well, I'll be very interested to talk to you further about that after this, <laughs> if possible. But it's certainly a weed we're watching. And anything like that, it's best to keep monitoring it, let us know. And it's something that we need to keep on the watch list so it doesn't spread even more. What about weeds and pasture? How do we remove thistles from pasture and um, ragwort? There, there, um, the, the traditional role is deplete its reserves by keeping on topping it, um, keep mowing it. You don't get thistles in silage fields because they're cut too early and so they is that what they do, but they, they're not such a big problem. There are, um, we've mentioned the electric weeder, there is a handheld machine that they, they offer, which you need a quad bike to pull around the generator, but you zap it and it basically heats it up, shorts it out at the growing point and kills it that way. And so that looks like it's got some potential, but with the ragwort particularly, I don't know what happens with regards to it drying and um, animals eating it, which is when the risk is. Ragwort on its own isn't a risk, it's ragwort when it's cut and wilted becomes a danger. So um, constantly topping is the most common practice at the moment without chemicals. With the electrical weeder in pasture, we're looking at dock control at the moment. So again, we can get the stock back into the field straight away, which is fantastic. We don't need the seven day window, which you quite often need after chemical application. But I wouldn't do that if it was ragwort. I would make sure, because obviously if there's any dead material still on the soil surface and it gets grazed, then that's the problem. But for dock and thistle control, again, we're looking at this electrical um, weeder as an option. At the moment, we don't have a fully automated kind of tractor-mounted system, so we're doing a lot of trials with spot treatment. But it's something to watch for the future, and I think it could be really good with an integrated approach with other options as well. Is it recognised a particular weed? No, so you would have to operate, you'd have to, as the operator, or it would be dragged as, like a weed wiper is used, so when you would graze the field so the grass is reduced, you'd leave your docks at a certain height and then take it through as a weed wiper, but it would, it would be an electrical bar instead of um, the chemical, so it can, it can do the height differentiation. The machine we're using for the black current trial that Lynn's mentioned is mounted on the front of a tractor, it's to work within the three metre strip which is between the black current rows, but it's actually currently set up just to do the meter either side, which is known as a herbicide strip or a bear strip for, from kind of the harvesting. So in theory, we could set it, the machine could be made to spread across say six meters, and then it only uses power when it touches something. Yeah. So it could run along as a front mounted machine just to take out the weeds. So there's a potential there. It's, that particular machine on that is run off a PTO on a little um, orchard tractor. So it just rumbles up and down. It could rumble up and down the field. PTO? Um, it's PTO driven to run a generator. Oh, sorry, power takeoff shaft. From the tractor. Is anybody working on a robot which would recognize ragwort and remove it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the Dutch have a system and they have had for quite a while and um, it can recognise the wide leaf against the grass and it works by a screw auger going in but it's not commercialised yet and I think it's the cost of commercialisation at the moment um, but the technology and it works obviously you've got the problems of fully automated vehicles but we're seeing more acceptance of that you know people have robotic mowers for their gardens and this is just like a kind of scaled up version of that and should be available it, it is it's there and it works and it can happen um talking about uh, managing weeds and grasslands, we're integrating lays into our system to help control black grass, which we think is having an effect, but are we likely to bring, be bringing in new weed problems and is anything being seen with that? Yep, again, working on a project at the moment with some of our soil scientist colleagues um, on this bringing um, graze lays into arable rotations and certainly we do consider some of the cover crops we're monitoring those really carefully to make sure they don't become a weed in the future because that's obviously a big concern but again most of these systems are then much more diverse so you've got the opportunity to control those later because you're in a different crop or a different drilling at a different time so at the moment we're not seeing huge problems with those but it's definitely something that is being monitored um, and is being looked at and um, you know carefully uh, looked into but it is 
really, really beneficial if you have a horrendous black grass problem or you have really highly resistant black grass because it is just breaking that cycle and it's a fantastic way to integrate um, lots of different weed control options and making your whole system a lot more diverse and widening the rotation um, is a fantastic way of doing that to keep on top of your weeds. Um, so from a practical point of view, we've got grass in conventional rotation and the organic rotation. Um, organically, it's a red clover and ryegrass lay that isn't grazed because we haven't got any stock. Um, so that is literally topped every couple of weeks. Or, well, really every time it comes to flower, unless I see some black grass that's in flower and then it gets topped whenever. Um, but if you top it really, really hard the first couple of times, you really encourage the clover to grow and then the weeds don't come. And that gives us two years of clean clean farming, if you like, to then go back into into wheat. Um, my problem, being a conventional farmer as well, is we produce a wonderful soil for two years, growing clover, and then we go and plough it up. Um, so we bring all the weeds back up. Um, yeah, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, no, talk to that man over there and tell me. <laughs> um, but then conventionally, we've got um, we normally have a one year Westworld ryegrass in the rotation because on one farm we've got stock. The, the, the own landowner's got stock. Um, what we've done there is, um, I mean, normally, I was told at college you put wheat in after grass. Um, we put also rape in after grass. Um, it gives us grass weed control options, um, but it also, um, when I can grow rape, which the last couple of years has been tough, um, it gives me the opportunity to put my rape in the middle of August when I want to put it in and not wait for a crop of wheat or barley to come off. Um, so there's two or three cuts of silage. Come the beginning of July, that gets sprayed off, um, and we're in there with rape. Second week of August, third week of August, putting rape in. Um, it gives me a much more reliable entry, um, and also we've got more options. Chemical control. Um, I know we're not here talking about chemical control, but it just—it's about rotation and thinking about different things, really. I was just going to say also, <clears throat> from an organic point of view, yes, we do plow. One of the other practices which is becoming more common is to equally not follow the ploughed up lay with, with a wheat crop, but follow it with, with oats. Because oats is a really competitive plant, so you, you're swamping and competing with, with the weeds that are trying to grow. Um, it's also allelopathic, so what it means is it produces chemicals which stop other plants germ germinating, so you get a clean lay. You can also quite easily follow oats with um, a wheat crop. And the fertility from ploughing up is often available in the second autumn rather than the first autumn. So you actually do harvest it much better. So again, it's using culture, using rotations, using diversity and changing things. So the weed, you don't let the weed think it's in control. You've got to make the weed constantly thinking, what's he doing next? Not the other way around. <laughs> Um, just to come back to Jerry's point, actually, we've this year tried something different after clover. Um, we've grown spring beans. Um, so we ploughed the lay up in the all, uh, well late winter, spring beans in, gives us a very good opportunity to hoe, or, well, we've got, um, like Nikki said earlier, a pico harrow. Um, so we can go in there and you can really hurt, well, you can't hurt the beans, but you can really go in hard on the weeds. Um, also, our thinking is, um, Obviously that clover lay takes nitrogen to break down, which you rob off a wheat crop, say. So the beans don't need nitrogen. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll probably put a very early spring wheat in there um, in November, December time. Um, and that'll hopefully be a good spring wheat crop afterwards. And um, coming back to the initial question about are we seeing different weeds coming through as a result of introducing grass lays, I think the secret is not allowing it to flower. It's exactly the same as with the black grass, so you've got to be, and that's where Italian rye grass can really catch you out because it can flower and set seed very quickly. And there's interesting work being done by uh, salad growers of using phacelia as a cover crop and their absolute um, driving factor behind when they get rid of the phacelia is as soon as they see anything coming up to flower and setting seed they they cut it out and get rid of it and the other practice going to the beans again um, it's happening with cover crops direct drilling into a cover crop which is frost tender so if you drill beans in November into a cover crop of phacelia mustard and um, buckwheat if the buckwheat survived the first cold day of the, of the year, it then dies off over the winter, leaving a mulched, clean seedbed for the bean to grow in. 
Um, and the bean is a strong, resilient plant, so you'll get, you know, we used to play with them in, so it's a pretty strong plant resilient. And so you can end up with a mulched crop, which is relatively weed free. It's not perfect, and it's something we don't know enough about yet. But we've got to learn as organic farmers from what the conservation agriculture farmers are doing, just like we're expecting them to learn from what we do. So it works both ways, that argument. Absolutely. Another one on that, actually, with, with beans is intercropping. So I work on the Innovative Farmers Field Lab on intercropping. Um, and one of our farmers is an organic farmer um, who has got a, quite a big wild oat problem, which is quite something maybe we could talk about as well, um, wild oats in, in non-chemical systems. Um, but what he's doing is a wheat and bean mixture. So he's basically getting that wheat in the niche of, of the wild oats. Um, and what we've seen, it la it's, this is the second year, um, so he's comparing a monoculture with a wheat bean mixture. Last year it was 72% uh, less weed biomass in the mixture and this year it's 74. So we've seen pretty consistent results there um, and it's quite notable in the field. Um, so he's, he's growing that for feed um, and so he's keeping it as a, as a mixed crop so that's how he's making it work. But I think there's real potential for, for intercropping for weed suppression. Is that something that any of you have done some work with or aware of anything? Yeah, we had a, a project on intercropping spring wheat and spring beans, used two different varieties of beans. So um, Fuego, um, which is a, a modern kind of shorter variety, and um, what's a really old variety that's just gone 60 years old? Um, oh, it's horrible standing up here, I forget something. <laughs> anyway, um, a taller variety, Maris Bead. That's it. And um, we were interested whether what the impact of the two different varieties, um, you know, whether the height was an important thing in suppressing the weed. But the overall factor was that um, we had equal yields. Um, so you, you work on what's called a land equivalent ratio. So if the two crops together gave the same yield as what they would have given in isolation, that would be a yield of one, that's equal, but we had 1.2, so 20% more crop from intercropping. And we found the best scenario was when you um, had two rows of wheat drilled, two rows of beans, two rows of wheat, two rows of beans, rather than randomly putting the beans around. And it seems that pattern had uh, more vigor in its growth and was better at suppressing weeds. So that pattern seemed really important. We did one and one and three rows of wheat, three rows of beans. So pattern was important in that, and it did suppress weeds. Um, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to... Basically, we are, whether we like it or not, we're looking at glyphosate being off the, off the cards in the next few years. Um, what options are there available um, to us? Where do we go? How do we prepare for a post-glyphosate era? Okay. I'll start. <laughs> I think we've covered it already. We've talked about all the different options. Integrated approach has got to be the way forward. You've got to think wider than just one year. Think about where your weeds are. Think five years if you can for where those weeds are in the seed bank or if they're perennial weeds. What are you doing with the root system? So again, a lot of organic farmers, you'll have problems with cooch where conventional farmers don't. So think plan i know weeds aren't the only thing when you're making your decisions they are in my world but you've got lots of other things as farmers to consider but please try and think acro across a wide rotation and i think there will be there, there are ways we can do it if we do lose um, glyphosate and we've just got to have a different approach and a, a different mindset um, I thought we weren't mentioning the G word. Um, uh, so, as a farmer, what are we doing? Um, I built a crimper roller. Um, seen the idea in the States, so we built one. Um, we've had two years so far playing with it. Um, last year it worked, but it was 35 degrees. Um, we'll see what happens next week when we start using it again, when it's not so hot. Um, but I think, like we've been saying, um, rotation... Um, bring grass back into rotation, livestock, um, farms, conventional and organic need to become a bit my, more diverse um, and thinking long term and I go 10 years, not, you know, just, you, you, I, farming's a long term thing, it's not a year by year and I have it with contract farms that we do um, that only think six months ahead sometimes, um, but you know, you, you, you've really got to look at what you're doing and what you want to do in the next five to ten years really um, and the other thing, I don't think um, a lot of people say if we lose glyphosate, no till will go, direct drilling will all finish because we haven't got glyphosate. But 
it won't. Um, we'll use cover crops. Um, we might have slightly weedier crops, um, but also we might go back on some old chemistry that's still about. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, it won't be the end of conservation agriculture or no-till, whatever word you want to put to it. Um, there will be a way. I think diverse rotations are going to be really important in it. I mean, we've had lots of farmers who are on, um, you know, wheat, barley, rape rotations at the moment, having moved away from being wheat, rape, wheat, rape, and that's why we've got to the black grass situation we're in. So um, I think a lot of it's going to come down to how farmers are supported to do that in the post-BPS era and how the environmental land management scheme enables farmers to do that. And if they choose to support um, cover crops, grass clover lays, grass lays generally, then it will help enormously with um, weed management in those situations. Um. Innovative Farmers did a trial on terminating cover crops without glyphosate. The results have just come out now, I think, any time now. The answer is yes, you can control cover crops without using glyphosate. One of the solutions was actually using liquid nitrogen fertiliser because um, it scorched it to death in the, in the spring. He then used that as part of the fertiliser for the next crop on. So he, it was a, um, a spring linseed. And so on a trial involving a comparison of the total nitrogen applied, it actually worked. Um, we might have to get up earlier in the morning and roll when it's frosty because a Cambridge roll on a cover crop when it's minus five degrees there's a brilliant photo went round, the, round on, on Twitter where because he'd swung round and missed he had the, the, the triangles every, every time he turned a brilliant effect, we've got to use the weather and the other thing we need to do is look at the crops that we're growing, the varieties we're growing and why we're choosing those varieties um, for example, there's a new wheat variety just come out which has said it's not good for weed control. What the hell is the point of a wheat crop that's not good for competing with weeds? We've got to use the crop to compete as well. The weed will not grow if it's getting no light. And I know I'm old, but we used to grow a variety called Reaper which took over the ground so much that nothing would grow underneath it. And then we moved to these new varieties and they're not competitive. They can't compete with themselves, let alone a weed. So let's use the crops to do the work for us as well. That a weed? was a wheat yeah and going back to that I have never heard of it I'm old <laughs> <laughs> and I also farmed in Devon so maybe it was different <laughs> but getting a competitive start is really important getting a crop away that has the ability to um, compete against the weeds initially that, that starting establishing crops is vital in the system well, thank you so much we are now out of time um,